Wow, look at this image. It's almost like a piano concerto for the left hand. Even the keys are of exactly the right size, nicely adjusted to the fingers of the human hand. And there are black keys, quite a few of them actually. This illustration was made some 700 years ago. And yet that little house organ looks totally modern, like something I could go ahead and play right away. At least, if I could persuade that bellows pumper behind the pipes to supply a steady and powerful airflow. Of course, the organ player has not lost his right arm, he's just using it for something else. It's a set of bells which he is playing with the hammer. The illustration comes from a manuscript copied only a few decades after the year 1300. The date is important for it tells us that chromatic keyboards were made by this time. That ties in with the use of sharps in contemporary compositions. We've talked about this in the previous lecture. The two pages of the manuscript are meant to illustrate the seven liberal arts, which made up the basic curriculum of the medieval university. We call them arts because that is the word used for them in Latin, artes. But in Latin that word had a much broader meaning than it does today. It didn't mean art in the narrow sense of visual arts or performance arts, but rather something like science or discipline or branch of knowledge. It was by definition something bookish. The liberal arts were also by definition not crafts with which to make one's living. That is why they are called liberal or free. The freedom here is that of, say, a leisure gentleman in ancient Athens who does not have to work and has all the time in the world to engage in intellectual pursuits. For these pursuits to be truly liberal, it is important that they be useless, or at least have no vulgar utilitarian purpose. Look at the astronomer there. He practices his science not by going outside and gazing at the wandering stars, which are already visible in the sunset, but by reading a book. Then there's the master of geometry, trying hard to work out something very difficult about spheres. And there is arithmetic, which, by the look of it, has progressed as far as counting to twelve. The next liberal art is Latin grammar. Now, how would you depict that? What kind of image would tell you immediately and without a doubt that we're dealing with grammar? Why, of course, it's a solid beating with the whip. No good grammar was ever taught without a healthy dose of gratuitous violence. Judging from the looks on the other boys' faces, it may even have added a certain entertainment value to what might otherwise be a dull and boring affair. Heck, even the whipping boy seems to be having a good time. The coolest of the seven arts is, of course, music, there on the right-hand page. It has an almost palatial room to itself, with brightly colored wallpaper to match the colorful tones in the chromatic keyboard. By comparison, there's only a tiny room set aside for the art of rhetoric. I'm not exactly sure what's going on here. One of the students is holding a document with a seal hanging from it. The other is leaning on a stick. Something tells me that this is not going to end well. The seventh and last art is logic. Since men are not known for their reasoning skills, 
In fact, they are widely reputed to be bereft of almost every sense of logic, owing to the degrading effects of testosterone, the master of logic is, in fact, a magistra. She cannot be in this teaching position unless she herself had attended university as well. But let's go back to where we left off in the previous lecture. We spoke of a major change in the sound of polyphonic music. It had to do with diatonic and chromatic scales. A quick review, before we continue this story. Suppose we're in Paris, around 1280, and we enter a deep coma. The last music we hear is a lovely motet about the pleasures of living in the French capital. It is state-of-the-art, the most advanced music imaginable. When we wake up 50 years later, we cannot believe our ears. Composers are creating all kinds of pitches that we never knew existed. The sounds are not without a certain seductive appeal, but they feel wrong. It's hard to suppress the urge to go to confession and purge our ears of this potentially diabolic stuff. The composer who wrote this piece is Guillaume de Marchaud. We have already encountered him in this image, on the left, painted in his direct proximity. His music is full of sharps and flats, each as deliciously strange and delightfully twisted as the next. But how did he and others come up with these new pitches? How did they rationalize them? And what were the rules for using them? I've decided to explain this with the help of the American National Anthem. Let's hear the first phrase of that anthem, played on the piano. It sounds lovely. And yet the anthem can be played only on a modern piano with a chromatic keyboard, not on a diatonic keyboard. For there are several pitches that don't exist in music from before about 1300. If we had to play the anthem on a diatonic keyboard, the closest approximation to the tune as we know it would be this.
It does indeed sound different now, but what is the difference? Let's listen again. The difference can be heard in a short passage that consists of four successive chords. Let's play those. First with the melody of the anthem above, then without that melody, just the chords, and finally those same chords with a heavy bass underneath. Now, why did I put that heavy bass underneath the four chords? It is to underline an important point about them. They are not just any four chords. They are arranged in such a way as to create so-called cadences, or cadential progressions. Don't worry if those terms are not immediately familiar. There will be plenty of time to explore what cadences are. For now, the important point about cadences is that they give a sense of closure. Say you are a composer. You've reached almost the end of a new composition. All that's missing is some sort of musical gesture that will tell the listener that the piece has come to an end. In the last seven centuries, the conventional way to do that is with a cadence, like this. That sounds pretty final. Of course, you may still decide to compose more music after this but the cadence gives no hint of any such continuation. That finality is the first and most important thing to remember about cadences. Two chords, which are felt to close off something when played in immediate succession. The cadence you just heard would well work well in a major key, but if you're composing in a minor key, you would most likely conclude with a cadence like this. But, as I said, there is something about those two cadences that cannot be rendered on a diatonic keyboard. The keys you need just aren't there. In the following sample, I'll mark the missing keys temporarily as red, but they will quickly vanish like the phantoms they are. The only available pitches on the diatonic keyboard that can be used instead are these. So, if you want to play the National Anthem, there is no choice but to play all of it on this and other white keys. Of course, this is still the same tune, but it lacks something. The thing that cannot be rendered on the white keys is a leading tone. It's a step that seems to drive more compellingly to the second chord, and gives the cadence a greater sense of urgency. The reason is that the step is closer to the note that comes after it. Thanks to the sharp sign, it's already halfway there, just a semitone away, not a whole tone like that white key just before it. So this is what it comes down to. Leading tone. No leading tone. Now let's say you're a Michaud and you're writing awesome mix number 23 with nothing to help you but an old diatonic keyboard, like the one you see here. Let's create a progression that sounds almost like a cadence except that on this keyboard it cannot be. Fortunately, you are not writing this piece for keyboard, but for singers, and you can tell the singers to intone any pitch you like. All it takes is the sharp sign, which tells them to raise a note by half a step. In this case, it's a note F that could spice up the whole thing if it were raised to F sharp. Here's another progression. It sounds okay on the diatonic scale, 
I mean, it's not completely horrible, but not terribly exciting either. What this passage needs is a leading tone. It would make the whole progression so much more compelling. Just like we turned F into F sharp in the previous example, we can now turn G into G sharp. Here it is the same story. The F in the first chord sounds good, but F sharp would sound better still. We're on a roll now, so let's move on to example four. This is lovely. You have G going to A and in two voices at that. So let's raise the G to G sharp in both voices. Glorious. Now let's look at example five. It's perfect. Not only do we have F to G, but we have C to D at the same time. Let's give both sharps and turn them into F sharp and C sharp. Example six, another C which we can turn into C sharp. And that G above, the one that progresses into A, maybe we could even sharpen that. On a diatonic keyboard, they sound like this. And here is the chromatic rendering. Now, we worked this out as though we were Macho sitting behind a diatonic keyboard. But what is the sounding end result when the motet is sung with human voices? Let's compare the chords that we played on the piano with the actual recording. You could well say that Marshall hears all these passages as cadences, but that is only because he loves that chromatic leading tone so much. He doesn't want the progressions to make it sound as if the music had come to an end. But what exactly does he understand by cadence? To explain this, I'm now going to introduce two related concepts, perfect and imperfect. Nowadays, we speak of things as perfect when they have absolutely no flaws, like a phone call could be perfect. But perfection is almost like an unattainable ideal. If I had the presumption to call myself perfect, it's as if I proclaimed myself a saint. Is true perfection to be found in this world at all? If there is such a thing as perfection, surely it could only be the attribute of a divine being. Yet all this is the modern understanding of the words perfect and imperfect. It's not how people thought of perfection in the distant past. The key lies in the Latin verb for to make, which is facere. The participle made is factus, and something that is made is a factum or fact in modern English. We encounter the adjective factus in the word perfectus. Vowels are unstable in Latin, as in many other languages, but the words are the same. The only significant difference is the prefix per. That prefix is often used to reinforce a Latin verb. 
per means literally through, but as part of a verb it means completely, wholly, thoroughly. So if the verb fakere means to make, then per ficere means to finish making. It means to complete the job. And if something made can be described as factus, then something completely made is perfectus. If you look at it like this, perfection is not unattainable at all. If you're making something and it is in principle possible to complete the making of it, then perfection is totally within reach. The perfection of a thing has less to do with some divine ideal than with its inherent potential. When that potential has been fully realized, the thing is fully made or perfectus. This, by the way, is why no theologian would have called God perfect, for that would imply that he was made and that there was another maker more powerful than him. But it's only things in creation that are made. The creator of it all is not himself part of creation. In Christian worship, the credo says that Jesus was, quote, begotten, not made, unquote, an essential point to believers, for he could not be a divine being if he was made. By the same token, when people spoke of imperfect, they did not mean that it was inherently and irredeemably flawed. On the contrary, it still had the potential to become perfect. It just hadn't reached that stage yet. Imperfect is synonymous with incomplete. So if somebody has just finished making a phone call, I would be the last to argue that the phone call wasn't perfect. It has been completed after all. But now my brain is starting to hurt from all this philosophizing, so let's go back to music. Here is an example of something literally imperfect. It is the last, or one of the last, compositions written by Johann Sebastian Bach, and it is included in the awesome mix as item 58, The Art of Few. Bach died before he could complete this piece. The inscription here on the right was made by his eldest son. It says literally, Upon this fugue, and then he describes the way it's put together, the author passed away. Whenever I read that sentence, I somehow imagine that Bach passed away while composing, with his head suddenly dropping upon the score. There are plenty of musicologists who have written elaborate completions to the best of their understanding of what Bach might have intended. But the recording included in the awesome mix ends in midair. That is what it means for something to be imperfect. I took this short detour because it shows a different way of understanding what a cadence is. I said that the cadence provides closure, that it has the power to conclude a composition. That means it brings perfection. So if you want to define a cadence the way it was originally understood, you would say it progresses from imperfect to perfect or incomplete to complete. When it comes to Bach's last unfinished work, you could already bring it to completion by appending a short cadence. Here is the ending as it starts, first as played by the string quartet. And then the same ending on the piano. The simplest way to bring this to closure is to take that last measure as chord number one and then add chord number two to complete the cadence. Here's an example. Once you've settled on this progression, you can elaborate it a bit. For example, make it sound a little polyphonic by separating out voices and making it look as if they moved independently. Yet it is important to exercise moderation, for it's easy to get carried away. There is a lot of creative scope in situations like this. Here's an example of another chord you could append. It 
It's just a band-aid, of course, but you can still give it a little propulsive force. And that kind of propulsion is really what the leading tone is about. But now let's go back to the time of Marchaud and other composers active between about 1300 and 1350. Why are they important? Because they were the inventors of the cadence. Which leads to the next question. Why is the cadence important? Answer? Because it would remain the governing principle of musical composition for almost 700 years. Like the chromatic keyboard, the cadence is an invention of decisive historical importance, and it will prove to be only the second of three such inventions, all in the same century. For composers in this period, a perfect sonority was one of those harmonic intervals that could be demonstrated on the monochord. What made them perfect? Well, just listen. This is not a sonority that leaves things dangling in mid-air. It's not begging you to put it out of its misery and depend another chord already. It's perfectly self-sufficient. An imperfect chord is the exact opposite. It's a sonority that makes you wonder what comes next. There's movies that end like that. The screen slowly fades to black, the music goes quiet, and then there are several tense moments in which you're wondering uneasily, surely this can't be the end? It's not until the titles come scrolling down that you realize it's over, and you feel like you've been had. It's precisely because the imperfect chord is imperfect, or open-ended, that the perfect chord coming after it feels like a true ending. It's almost as if you have to heighten the feeling of imperfection in the first chord, in order that the second can be all the more fulfilling. And if you want to make it even more fulfilling, just throw in a leading tone or two. The leading tone is really a marker of imperfection. The only reason it's satisfying is that it literally leads into a sonority that is perfect. Once you develop a taste for it, the sounds are delicious. But if you've just woken up from a 50-year coma, you will be astonished at the sheer madness of younger generations of musicians. What possesses them to fill their music with imperfect sonorities? Just to relive time and again the moment of their being brought to perfection? Why not make everything perfect to start with? Like that motet about the joys of living in 13th century Paris. If I take away the rhythmic detail and reduce it to its bare sonorities, I hear nothing but perfect chords. Almost any of these chords would make, could make a satisfactory ending. Now compare this with a second composition by Marchaud, his French song Biaute qui toutes autres pères, again from around 1340. It's almost as if this piece tumbles from one cadence into another. I have mixed in piano renderings of the cadential progressions in order to make them more clearly audible. <laughs> Now, as we just heard, the typical 14th century cadence sounds like this. In classical music, the cadential progression will be theorized differently, but the musical principle remains the same. 
It's a sense of resolution. And we find the same progression still at work in late Romantic harmony. The so-called Tristan progression, from Richard Wagner's opera Tristan und Isolde, plays upon the same idea of imperfect sound resolving into perfect. The overture of the opera is part of the awesome mix number 77. Here is the Tristan progression as you hear it played by the orchestra. And here is the same progression on the piano. The reason why the Tristan progression has become so famous is because it is paradoxical. It gives a sense of resolution, and yet the second chord still needs resolution of its own. It only keeps you waiting for the imagined final conclusion. So, from the 14th century to the 19th, five centuries in all, you see how this new invention, the cadence, remains the focus of intense compositional preoccupation. Its full significance will become clear as the semester rolls on. Before moving on to the next great discovery of the 14th century, I want to take a moment to illustrate one more thing about the cadence. It is the cadenza, which I already mentioned in the previous lecture. Cadenza is the Italian word for cadence, and it is appropriate, for the final solo section of a concert is exactly that, a cadence. The way to hear it is like a sentence of which you've just heard the first few words, and are now expecting to hear the conclusion within a minute or so. After the midterm break, I will have plenty to say about the E-flat major piano concerto by Christian Bach, the youngest son of Johann Sebastian. It's a very rich piece. But now is a good time to give an indication of how cadential progressions will be used to keep long stretches of music together. In this case, the cadenza is an elaboration of an actual cadence, which takes only a few seconds to play. Yet there is that moment right before the conclusion on which you can choose to linger. Once you do, everything is kept suspended in mid-air. The moment of imperfection is prolonged, and the audience has no choice but to hear out the soloist until she is ready to launch the much-awaited perfection. Johann Christian Bach, his music is awesome, wait for it. 
So here are the key concepts. The cadence is a progression from one chord to another, moving from imperfection to perfection. To add urgency to it, one can introduce a leading tone, a step that has no other purpose than to lead into the next sonority from which it is only a semitone removed. The leading tone is marked in the score by a sharp sign. The use of leading tones quickly becomes universal in art polyphony and will soon lead to modifications of the contemporary keyboard. By the end of the 14th century, chromatic keyboards have become the norm. There will be no further changes to the keyboard except expansion of the overall range, from two octaves to more than seven. Cadences and chromatic keyboards are two of the big three capital C's of the 14th century. The third C is just as important and influential as the others. It is counterpoint. Counterpoint has become so deeply integrated in the fabric of Western music history, including rock music, popular music, jazz and other genres, that it's hard to imagine there was ever a time when it didn't yet exist. To this day you can take courses in counterpoint here at Princeton University. The course number is Music 205 and the course title is Species Counterpoint. The music department offers this course not to meet a demand for knowledge about 14th century music. In fact, that century is rarely mentioned in courses of this type. The aim is rather to teach what counterpoint had become by the 16th century or the 18th, to follow the didactic methods with which it was taught to great names like Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, and to just about every composer since. So, what is counterpoint, and why has it come to assume such importance? Counterpoint is, first of all, a particular type of polyphony. I call it particular because it has a distinctive grammar, a distinctive set of grammatical rules, which is unlike that of all other types of polyphony. One learns the grammar by internalizing those rules. They are strictly enforced, and they don't allow exceptions, or at least not very many. These rigid rules are not imposed out of a desire to make other people's lives a misery, like we saw in the illustration of Latin grammar at the beginning of this lecture. A better way of thinking about them is like a sport. If you want to play a sport like tennis, for example, you're going to have to accept that there are rules and that those rules are not up for discussion. Take it or leave it. There is not some authoritarian motive behind them. They're just what players must agree upon before the game starts. The rules of counterpoint are simple. You can summarize them in one page. But it takes time to internalize them and to use them in creative musicianship. It's like learning to speak a language. The rules have to become second nature. They have to shape one's musical thinking and musical sensibility. Those basic rules have not changed in 700 years. But in order to make music with them, one is going to have to add a lot of detail. It's like the difference between the basic rules of English grammar on the one hand, and on the other, everything you need to know to hold a coherent discourse about, say, organic chem chemistry, vocabulary for starters. And those musical details change from century to century. That is why the textbooks, which kept appearing on the screen right now, include titles like 16th century counterpoint, 18th century counterpoint, modal and tonal counterpoint, jazz counterpoint. The one thing that's missing is the age in which counterpoint was born, the 14th century. There's one more point I need to make about counterpoint. I've gone to some pains to describe it as something interesting and fun, on the eminently reasonable ground that I think it is. But the idea of enforcing and obeying rigid rules has given counterpoint a bad name. And I can't deny that there is some justification to it. There is a hint of that same brute authoritarianism we witnessed in the Latin grammar lesson at the beginning of the lecture. This is less to do with the rules per se than with the freedom to sing anything other than counterpoint. Was there in fact another musical language or grammar that you could use whenever you felt like it, just like I might be in the mood for pizza tonight and Tex-Mex tomorrow? The short answer is no. In the period we're now entering, there are only two th types of music recognized 
by experts and laypersons alike, plain chant and counterpoint. Music effectively equals counterpoint. It's as simple as that. It is in large part because nobody plays or sings anything else. You could compare it to those people before the age of television who had spent all their lives on the island that is England, Wales and Scotland and had never left it to visit other countries. English was all they knew. Except that to them it wasn't English so much as language altogether. In the unlikely event that they ever met a stranger, let's say a Dutchman, they might well have wondered if the Dutch, for all their evident backwardness, had already developed some primitive conception of language. Wouldn't that be interesting? It would be like running into a real-life caveman. The earliest surviving evidence of counterpoint is found in this little manuscript, which is almost as small as that Winchester manuscript with early two-part organum. It is a treatise by a French monk named Peter. For some reason his nickname is Of the Idle Palm, as in the palm of your hand, and idle as in inactive, not doing anything. Goodness knows why anyone would want to call him that. It's like two people having a conversation in which one of them says, Hey, do you mean Peter with the pot belly? No, replies the other. I mean Peter of the idle palm. Oh, that one, says the first. I know who you mean. It's the dude who doesn't use his palm for anything, right? Yeah, he did write a treatise on counterpoint, though. Near the end of the treatise, Peter gives a written example of counterpoint. That example is the earliest known counterpoint to survive, to survive at all, the first example in a nearly 700-year-old tradition. There is no recording with live voices, but I have created the next best thing, which is a computerized rendering with the sound patches of live voices. So, ladies and gentlemen, prepare to be amazed. You are now about to witness the musical equivalent of the first moon landing. It's the birth of counterpoint. You may have noticed something novel about this piece, and if you didn't pick it up right away, you can still see it in the score. There are eight notes with a sharp. That means eight leading tones, and therefore eight cadences or credential progressions. Undoubtedly some of the other notes were meant to be sung with a sharp as well, but Peter doesn't think it necessary to spell that out every time. Still, if we stick just to the notated sharps, it turns out that the example adds four black keys to the original diatonic keyboard, in the same way that Marchaud did in the Suspirant Chœur. That is not a coincidence. The three C's of the 14th century, cadences, chromatic keyboard and counterpoint, are closely interrelated. Together they change the face of music forever. They will become a fact of life for just about every composer and musician who has been active since. Now, Peter's example for three voices is simple counterpoint. The rules add nothing but the rules. But I said you can add rich amounts of musical detail, in the same way that you can add the vocabulary of organic chemistry to the basic rules of grammar. Let's now take a look at how this works in practice. A moment ago we already heard a sample of Marchaud's courty song Biaute qui tout autre père item number 22 in the awesome mix. Now I propose to look more closely at what's going on here. In this example I have placed little purple ovals around the sharps. As we will hear in the sound clip, each of them is a leading tone. That is to say, each sharp is notated in order to push a cadence along. We'll now hear the same example that I played before, with piano chords mixed in. Those piano chords highlight the relevant credential progressions. In the score, there will be a red box around each cadence. 
Let's listen. You'll have noticed that there is quite a lot of electricity in this piece, or to put it in different terms, it's richly seasoned with dissonant spice. That is part of Marshall's style, and it constitutes the kind of detail that is not legislated by the counterpoint rules. Let's play the same passage on the piano and mark all these dissonances in the score with the help of red asterisks. Wow, that's 25 clashes between the three voice parts. Why would Marshall do that? Surely he knew the truth about consonants, as demonstrated on a monochord. Why descend from the mathematical simplicity and purity of harmonic sounds and throw in all these moments of friction? Well, one thing is for sure, he does it deliberately. How do I know, or think I know? It's because of the device he uses to create almost all of his dissonances, so-called displacement. The best way to show this is to undo the application of that device. Look at that middle part. The symbol you see at the beginning, marked by the purple oval, is a rest. Because of it, the middle part enters a little later than the others. Now, if you take away that rest, the whole middle part will shift to the left. And this is the score we would end up with. So by shifting that part to the left, we have lost 11 dissonant clashes in one fell swoop, almost as many as the clashes that now remain. That cannot be coincidence. In fact, we know it's not, because Marshall does this kind of thing all the time. But now look at that first note in the bottom part, once again highlighted by an oval. If we take that note and make it shorter by one half, we lose another seven dissonances. Now, I should emphasize that the steps we just undid are hypothetical. They're my reconstructions. There's no proof that this is how Marshall went to work. All I can say is that it is plausible, for the changes are tiny, and yet they produce long trails of dissonances. Now, when I asked the question why Marshall would do this, I didn't immediately answer it. That is because I wanted to give you the opportunity to judge for yourself if the displacements make much of a difference to the sound. To my ears, they do. According to ancient and medieval music theory, dissonances are bad. But in the song by Marshall, the dissonances are only short, fleeting moments. The reason Marshall introduces them in such quantity is precisely that they are short. That is what makes them useful. For here's another thing that the 14th century discovers, that dissonant clashes between voices have a percussive effect. They add rhythm and drive. So when you undo the hypothetical steps, you trade in rhythmic excitement in return for consonant sonority.
For Marcio, it was precisely the rhythmic excitement that mattered. I haven't put it quite as bluntly yet, but his music rocks. Of course, it helps that this example is played on the piano, for the piano is part string instrument and part percussive instrument. When you strike a key, a hammer jumps forward to hit the corresponding string. So the crunchy dissonances sound really awesome. We've traveled a long path through the 14th century, because the discoveries made in this period cast lodge such long shadows on subsequent centuries. The 14th is a weird century in many ways. It's split right down the middle by one of the most cataclysmic events in European history, the Black Death of 1347, a pandemic that raged across the continent and wiped out about 40% of the European population within the space of about five years. There were devastating famines in the early part of the century, with casualties also running into the millions. Then there are the horrible things humans did to each other. The Hundred Years' Wars war brought untold suffering, and there were continent-wide pogroms against Jews after people accused them of having caused the Black Death. At the same time, there is a sense of simple joy in life that springs up every time after each of these calamities had passed. You can tell it, for example, from the delight people take in dress fashion. Sleeves of various lengths, pointy shoes, checkered shirts, fur-trimmed fringes, and above all, bright colors. It's like people never loved being alive more than when they were closest to losing it. This sense of joy is reflected in a song that takes my breath away every time I hear it. Plusieurs gens by the composer Solage. You will hear plenty of sharps, but that is not the thing I want to draw attention to right now. It's a text that adds something endearing to the music. The composer offers a survey of the dress fashions of his time. The sheer variety alone is a tribute to the delight in clothing that people of all classes shared. But at the end of every stanza, he concludes that none of all that is for him, for at the end of the day, a jacket is enough, or in French, a jacquette. That may seem a pretty trivial thing to write a song about, until you realize that jacquette also means little Jacqueline. The song seems to be a tribute to a real-life Jacqueline. I see many people who take great pains to wear fine clothing. One puts on an embroidered tunic. Another a wooden garment lined with grey fur. They wear cloaks long or short, but when all is said and done, I stick to a jacquette. Others there are who, full of hot air, dress in well-made doublets, or in a tunic of cypress, and in other clothes of great worth, in which they are much more attractive. But when all is said and done, I stick to a jacquette. For it is so well-fashioned in all sizes, so I believe that in all the worlds there is no furred coat of soft, thick cloth, taffeta or rich silk, which pleases me as much. And for this reason I say, when all is said and done, I stick to a jacquette. The song is so exquisitely beautiful that you could easily believe the composer was madly in love with this Jacqueline. And yet, what a strange compliment, compliment he is paying her. For what he is saying effectively is, that the world is filled with fancy and sophisticated clothing, and that many people spare no expense to wear them. But Jacqueline is neither fancy nor sophisticated, and presumably nobody is interested in her, except for the composer, who is totally willing to settle for a jacquette. More disconcertingly, what does it mean that the jacket is, quote, so well fashioned in all sizes, unquote? I don't know quite what to make of that but it, doesn't sure, it sure doesn't sound right. 
I will play the song in two short slides of about 50 seconds each. The first features imagery of the colorful dress fashions shortly before the middle of the 14th century. The second is a video clip from Guardians of the Galaxy. I found just the perfect movie scene in which to mix plusieurs genres by Solange. What made it perfect is a moment of suspense, which is resolved only after a few interminable seconds. Now the song by Solange, being from the late 14th century, features plenty of cadential progressions. What could be more appropriate than to mark the moment of suspense with the first chord of a cadence and its re resolution with the second? Enjoy! <laughs> Share that information with me. Well, screw this then. I ain't waiting around for some Huey with a death wish. You got the orb, right? Yes. Now, we will be blown to bits. No! We're not leaving without the orb. <laughs> 